Well, good morning, Coastal. How are you guys doing this morning? So glad that you're here with us. My name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. And before we kind of dive in today, I just want to give it up for, for Pastor Terry and Pastor Craig over the last couple of weeks. I heard that they did an unbelievable job, uh, especially Pastor Craig. I heard that he even serenaded something. I don't know if that happened in second service, but I know that he cried in first service for you guys. Um, so, like, that's that's positive for him. Come on, let's give it up for those guys. It's kind of very, his, his token move. He cries. Uh, I don't know what the deal is with that. We're trying to we're trying to break him of that. It's just not working, and so I don't I don't know what the deal is. But uh, we're excited to be in this series called Perspective. We've been looking at the Book of Philippians, just a study in the Book of Philippians over the last couple of weeks. We've we looked at Philippians chapter one and Philippians chapter two, and today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter three. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bible to Philippians chapter three, that's where we'll be hanging out all day. Where we'll be all the scriptures will be coming out of there. And so if you don't have a Bible. You can look at your worship guide. If you don't have the worship guide, you can take out your smartphone. Look on you version. I'm really, really excited about today. And so if, if there's kind of a title for today's message, it would be seeing from a different perspective. Today it's all about seeing from a different perspective. Now, a few years ago, there was a, actually quite a few years ago, there was a pretty popular movie that was out there. It's a little weird, a little creepy, but uh, this, this movie came out and it was called the Sixth Sense. Anybody remember The Sixth Sense? Anybody remember that movie? A couple of you guys. Yeah, all the unholy people remember that movie. Do you, do you really religious people? You're like, I never would see a movie called that. Like, we only have three senses out of our five senses or 17. I don't know how many senses we have. Okay, I'm a pastor. Um, and so, like, The Sixth Sense. And, and there was a famous line in that movie, The Sixth Sense. Anybody remember what it is? I see dead people. Like, I don't know about you, but if I'm a parent and, like, my six-year-old comes up to me and tells me they see dead people, like, we're probably going to have some issues in my house. But, uh, like, this kid would come up and it's creepy and would say, I see dead people, you know, and would whisper it, which would make it even creepier. And, uh, you know, because he saw something that nobody else could see. And today I want to I want to tell you something uh, as your pastor that I see things a lot of times that you don't see. Uh, there are some things in life that I see that you probably never will see. And and on the flip side of that, there are some things that you see in life that I will never see. And because we all see some things differently. And today, if you're if you're taking notes, uh, kind of the key thought. Uh, if you're taking notes today, is this, is that what you've experienced in life determines what you see in life. What you've experienced in life will determine what you see in life. And, and it's because, because of some of our experiences that it determines what we see. And, and let me kind of explain it like this. Um, I grew up, and, and I'm going to use an example of myself and my wife, and so she's not here today, and so let me just preface all of this. Um, today, because my wife is not here, this is like Vegas, okay? <laughs> Seriously, okay? I'm tired of y'all, as soon as church ends, going out there and calling her up and telling her exactly what I said, okay? <laughs> That's not cool. That's not how this works, okay? Today, what happens in here stays in here, okay? She, she can watch a podcast or something if she wants, or I'm going to encourage her not to do that, okay? And so... Uh, so growing up, I, I came from kind of a wealthier family, and we traveled a lot, and, and I would go, and I remember a lot of times my mom and I would go on trips during the summer, and we would go, and we'd go see musicals, or we'd go to the ballet, and, and so I grew up in a lifestyle that was very much about seeing all these things that were very cultural, and so I, I would like to say I grew up very cultured. I, I'm a very cultured child. I really appreciate the arts. I really appreciate those things. Now, my wife, on the other hand, uh, she is the oldest of six kids, and so, uh, like, she, her family was a little bit different, they didn't necessarily have a lot of money, they didn't really go on a lot of vacations, they didn't travel a lot, but what they did is, is they owned a boat, and they were right near the Manatee River, my wife is born and raised in Florida, she's a Floridian, she's a rarity, you should take a picture, it's not a lot of them out there, and so, and so, like, she, she was growing up on the river, and so, she was, her and her family were always out skiing, and fishing, and all these different things. And because of our experiences, we see things differently. So, a couple of years ago, I took her to her first musical. Anybody out there ever been to a musical? Yeah, all the women. Uh, there's not a single guy that's like raising his hand to be proud of that, okay? Like, if you are, you are a cultured guy. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Like, you are a cultured man. Don't be ashamed of it. Okay, and so I took her to see Wicked, uh, which is a phenomenal... Yeah, the ladies are like, yeah, that's awesome. 
you know, and so like I'm waiting, we went, we went to, <laughs> sorry, uh, we went to go see Wicked, and, and you know, she had never been to a musical, and so there's all this stuff happening out there, Shayla, you're gonna, you're gonna watch over here, and she'd be like, oh, and, and all of a sudden, something would happen over there, and I'd be like, Shayla, you're gonna look over here, and all of a sudden, she'd be looking over there, and she'd be like, how did you know that those things were gonna happen, I, and I was just like, well, because I've experienced musicals before, I know where things are gonna kind of come out of, and what things are gonna happen in certain places, because of what I've experienced, it allows me to see things that you wouldn't normally see. And then this past week, we were on vacation, and we were on a cruise, and on one of the islands we got off on, we were on a boat, and we were seeing some things, and, and so we're out on this boat, and going out on a boat, and seeing the ocean, like a lot of people are like, I can just look at the ocean for hours, listen, it's water, it doesn't, it just, it sits there, like it's pretty boring to me, but like Shayla sees all this stuff that I don't ever see, she's like, did you see that group of snappers that just went by, and I'm like, what? Like, I saw some waves, babe. And she's like, no, 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 no. If you look in the water, you'll see, like, the shimmer of the scales of the fish. I'm like, I see blue ocean, okay? And because she sees things that I don't ever see. And I would tell you that you see things that other people don't see based on the experiences that are in your life. Like, for example, I'm walking to churches all the time, and because I've been studying church leadership, and I've been involved in leadership in churches for the past 15 years of my life, I walk into a church, and right away, I see things that need to change, that need to be updated, that need to be a little bit different, like that light needs to be adjusted, that person needs to play that part a little bit different, because I see things because of the experiences I have differently than people that just walk in and go like, oh, that's another church. Like, they did some music and some God talk because that's all that their experience has really been. They don't really see the behind the scenes. Now, there are some people in here that see things differently. Like, say, for example, your car breaks down. Anybody's car ever broke down? Most of us have broken down our cars. Now, if you're a God, what do you instantly do when your car breaks down? You go and you open up the hood, right? Because you're going to assess what's wrong in your car. Now, like when I open up the hood, I look to make sure the engine's still there because that's about the only thing that I know that should be there. <laughs> okay, like there's an engine, like it should run. Like that's my assessment because that's all of the experience I have. Now, now some of you other people, some of you guys, maybe some of you gals, maybe there's some, some gearheads that are women in here. You open up that hood and you go, oh man, the carburetor's not running properly. I don't even know where a carburetor is, but because of your experience, you see things differently and you're able to assess it and you're able to make a difference. And the reality is, is that we all see some things differently because of the experiences that we've had. And because of the experiences that we've had, it really determines what we see in life. And, and the Apostle Paul here is talking to the Philippian church, and he's talking to them based on some of his experiences. He's saying, listen, 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 you're one of my favorite churches. Like, I want to see God do some incredible things in you. And so he's, he's going, listen, I've gone through some experiences that I want to help you see some things that are maybe going to happen around you that you're not going to see. And because Paul has experienced so much in life, because he's experienced so much about the sinfulness of man, he understands a lot about how people are and how they react. And he also understands, to an extreme measure, because of some of his experiences, the goodness of God, because he's had an encounter with God like virtually none of us have had in our entire lives. And so he's saying, listen, I understand people. In fact, he, in, in talking about the sinless, sinfulness of man, he says, man, I'm the chief of sinners. Now, why would Paul claim that among, among himself? Why would he say, like, I'm the chief of sinners? Because he was a Pharisee who was constantly out persecuting the church. In fact, he killed a lot of the early church. And so he understood the sinfulness in his heart and how much that hate riled up inside of him and how he would go out and he would kill people based on beliefs that he had. And so he knew that he was sinful. And then when he found Christ, because he had found Christ, he realized that other people were just as sinful as he was. And they would beat him up. And he was shipwrecked at times. And he was whipped. And he was stoned. And I'm not talking like recreationally. I mean like stoned with rock. I mean, like this guy went through a lot of things. He really, really understood the sinfulness of people. And because he understood that, he said, man, I can, I can give you some things that you can see because of the experiences I've had. On the flip side of that, because he had had an encounter with God that said when he was on the road to Damascus, that a light shone down, whether he was riding a horse or walking, and that he was taken into like a third place space. That's how scholars say it, or a third heaven. And he had an encounter with Jesus, and during this encounter with Jesus, it radically transformed his life. 
And because of that encounter with, and that experience with Jesus, he had this love and this dependency upon God that other people didn't have. And he saw God in everything because of the experience that he had had. And he's saying, like, man, I've gone through life. And because of the experiences I have, I want to share some things with you. And what we said over the last couple of weeks is that if you weren't here, is that Paul is writing this book to the Philippian church from a prison in Rome. And, and his dream all of his life has been to go into preaching Rome. Like that's been the deepest, dark, biggest goal of his life. And he's thought, man, I just want to go. I want to preach in Rome. But instead of being in Rome as a preacher, he's sitting in Rome as a prisoner. And so he's saying, like, listen, I'm sitting here from a different perspective. But I want to help you see some things that maybe you're not seeing. And so we pick up in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And it says this. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now, Almost in every chapter of this book and over and over and over again, Paul is constantly reminding us to rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. He said, it's no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. He's saying, listen, it's not a big deal for me to write you rejoice because I understand where joy comes from and how to have joy in my life because it doesn't matter what position I'm sitting in in life, the external circumstances don't dictate internally what's happening inside of me. But, but because of what's happening inside of me, he said, man, I want to give you a safeguard. I want to help you see some things that maybe you're not going to see. I want to help you understand some truth that maybe isn't really there before you right now. And so I want to help you understand and comprehend what's going on. Because there were some things that were happening unknowingly among the Philippian Christians that they didn't see and they didn't understand because they didn't have the experiences yet to fully comprehend what was happening in society around them in the world of Christianity. And so let me kind of just give you a backstory of the history here. And so today is going to be pretty educational. But then I believe at the same point, you guys are going to be able to take some keys from here to look at your life and apply to your life that will radically transform your life. And so kind of a backstory of what's happening here. Jesus has died. He's risen again. He's gone up to heaven. Um, in the book of Acts, chapter 1 through 7, basically, the church has started. And basically, the church is predominantly to the Jews at this point. It's all 1 through 7. It's all about... Uh, the, the disciples reaching Jewish people. And so in, in chapter 8, all of a sudden there starts to be this kind of a, a little twerk. And they say like, you know what, maybe we can reach Samaritans. And Samaritans, if you don't know, are people that are half Jewish, half Gentile. And so they said, well, we're not really sure if they're really Jewish, but because they know some of the traditions, because they understand some of the history, they can probably find Christ. And, and so that's an important element for us to know. And so that's happening. And then in chapter 10, Peter has this encounter with God and feels like God's tells him to go to a guy named Cornelius and reach him who's a complete Gentile. He's actually a Roman. And so they go and they, they preach the gospel. And Cornelius and his family, his friends are radically transformed. They accept Jesus. And all of a sudden, like, all hell is breaking loose in the church because all of a sudden, people that are not Jewish, that haven't followed all the rules, that haven't followed all the, the regulations of the Jewish custom, and most of all, have not yet been circumcised, are all of a sudden saying they're, they're going to come to Jesus. Now, I want you to understand how big uh, of a, a stumbling block this was. Imagine today, if you're a man here, and you're not Jewish, you come in here and you hear the good news of Jesus, and at the end of that, we say, listen, man, we want you to prove how much you love God, and you can accept Jesus, and right after that, I have a scalpel, and we can do some circumcision. Mm. Like, you're going to really prove your love for Jesus right now, aren't you? Like, how many of you guys know that the men in church wasn't very big at that point? Like, like guys were like, uh, I think I'll keep whatever I have. Like, we have a hard time getting guys to get baptized, let alone circumcised. You know, and so, uh, and like, this is these are the requirements that they're putting on them. And so, like, there's this huge debate going on. And finally, in Acts chapter 15, what happens is they have the Council of, of Jerusalem. And they come together and they decide that, man... You don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to follow all the Jewish laws. You don't have to follow. You don't have to be circumcised in order to know Christ. And all of a sudden, this allows Paul and Silas and, and John Mark and some of the other guys to go out and preach the gospel to all the Gentiles that are out there. It isn't just something for Jewish people, but it's for all people. And they said, all you got to do to know Christ is be right with God. And so you become right with God by accepting Jesus into your heart. And so, man, this is huge. But yet there's some people that are following along after Paul 
called the Judaizers, who are typically Jewish people. Sometimes they were Gentiles who had taken on the Jewish law. And they would follow along and they would say, listen, listen, listen. What Paul is preaching to you about this grace and you just accepting Jesus, that's good. But that's not all of it. You've got to follow all these rules and you've got to follow all these regulations. And when you do that, then you've got to become circumcised. And then you'll really experience Christ. And so Paul is looking at the Philippian church and seeing this happen from a distance and going, listen, listen, listen. I want to give you some dangers that I see for you that maybe you don't see right now because you haven't had the experience yet to truly understand what's happening. And so because of that, he says, man, I want to give you three dangers that you need to look at and you need to be aware of so you don't fall into these traps that are being put before you. And the first one is this, is that we need to all see the danger of legalism. We need to see the danger of legalism. Now, some of you may say, like, what, what's legalism? Like, what exactly does that mean? And the most simple definition of legalism is substituting rules for relationship. Anytime you start substituting rules for a relationship, you get into a legalistic mindset where it's like, where you have to do A, B, C, and D in order to have this friendship, that's called a legalistic friendship. When it's all about you just being you and accepting and loving and those types of things where there's not all these things put on you, that's called a relationship. And so what's happening is people are coming in and saying like, you've got to do these things, you've got to substitute these things, and we do it today. We're, we say all the time, like, if you do A, B, and C, and D, then, like, we'll accept you, or we'll love you, or in the church, you know, we have all these different denominations that have all these different rules and regulations, whether it's Baptist, or it's Catholic, or it's Presbyterian, or it's Methodist, or it's Nazarene, it doesn't really matter. But it's substituting what should just be a relationship with God through Christ for a whole bunch of rules that are made up by people. And so he says in verse 2, he says, watch out for those dogs. And now this is kind of ironic that he says this because dogs would be the words that, that Jewish people would use to describe Gentiles. And what he's saying is he's saying like, man, I'm going to flip the switch on you and I'm going to call y'all dogs. Now, if he really wanted to get me, he would have called them some cats because like, nobody likes cats, right? <laughs> Could I get an amen right there? Like we hate some cats in this church. We hate them. What that they're good for, I don't even know what they're good for. So anyways... <laughs> If you have a cat, I'm sorry. Like, we'll pray for you at the end. We'll have some prayer people down here casting a demon out. I don't know, but it'll, we'll work on that. So, he says, watch out for these dogs. These men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. And, and he's referring to, he's referring to circumcision right here. He's saying, like, look out for the people that are all about circumcision. And he goes on to say, for it's we who are the circumcision. In other words, he's saying, listen, it's our hearts that have been circumcised. It's, it's God's gone in and, and the circumcision that God needed to do was, a, was inside of us. It was in our heart. See, because God, a lot of times we think that God is after us modifying our behavior. We'll just do this and this and this and this and God will accept us. But God isn't after behavior modification. God is after a transformation of our heart. He knows that if he transforms our heart, our behavior will automatically follow what's happening inside of us. Amen. Not the other way around. We can't try to change what's outside hoping that inside will be different. If we change what's inside, what's outside will transform. And then he goes on to say, he says, for it's we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And what he's saying right there is, is listen, we don't, we don't put our confidence in what we can do. It's not about our works. It's not about all the rules and regulations. What it's about is it's about realizing it's not about human effort. It's all about the grace of God and accepting that right there. And then he goes on in verse 4. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And so basically what he says is saying, listen, I know that some of y'all, you think you can put confidence in the flesh, but let me kind of just tell you a little bit about myself. Let me kind of give you the 411 on my life, because my life is all that in a bag of chips. Let me give you my resume if you want to talk about confidence in the flesh. He goes, here's my story. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharaoh. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalism, I was faultless. In other words, he's saying, man, I was born with the right family. I was part of the right uh, neighborhood. Like, I had the right education. I had everything going for me in life that people would look at and say, that's what you have to have. If it was in today's language, we'd be like, man, you know what? My dad is Billy Graham and my mom is Mother Teresa, even though she was never married. Like, like that's who my family is. And because of that, when Mother Teresa popped me out, like, I was so spiritual. Like, they dedicated me right away. The next day, like, I was so much 
literature. I just got water baptized. I came out. I was speaking in tongues. Miracles were following me. And as I was educated through the Christian school system, I finally got my Master of Divinity. And now I study theology for fun. Like, I've got it going on. And Paul's like, you know what? I've got the whole thing covered. Like, I've got it figured out. Man, I was born in the right place. I have the right education. He says, man, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And when he said that, like, everybody would have taken notice because what he was saying is he was saying, listen, I know that there's ten commandments and we struggle here to keep those. But he said, beyond that, it's not just the ten commandments. It's the 613 laws that follow after that you have to do. Like, I've got those all down. Like, I'm pretty good. Like, and some of those laws are so crazy. Like, if you would hear about them, a lot of them have to do with the Sabbath. Like, one of them is, uh, is say, you have a chicken, and on the Sabbath, they lay an egg. You cannot eat that egg. Because it was laid on the Sabbath. Work was done. And so, I think that's the reason why Chick-fil-A isn't open on Sundays. So I don't know. That's, that's where I pulled that from. Like, I'll put that together. I don't know. <laughs> Another one was is that if, if a mosquito bit you on, a, on the Sabbath, you couldn't scratch it because that would be considered doing work. Like, that was a law that they had. Another one, this one is for you ladies. If on the Sabbath, you couldn't look in a mirrored object or a reflective object because just in case you might see yourself and see one of those gray hairs that you possibly might have and you might want to pluck it out and that would be considered work. Like, that was horrible. Could you imagine a law like that, ladies? be a bad day. Like, for guys like me, it wouldn't really matter. Not much hair here. Uh, but, for those of you with lots of hair, there might be a gray hair for y'all. Or no makeup today. Ooh, no makeup Sunday. Ooh. <laughs> y'all are good looking group with makeup, but I don't know about the group. Uh, anyways. You know, and that was a legalistic environment. How would that translate into our society today? It'd be something like, man, well, you know what? I go to church every single Sunday. I never miss a Sunday. It doesn't matter if there's a good football game on or a golf match. I never miss a Sunday. In fact, I don't even miss Sunday nights. And then I go to a different church on Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday night, I go to a Bible study. And then on Thursday, I go to early morning prayer. And then I do like, and you just list out a whole bunch of things that you do. Because you're following all the rules. Or, or maybe it's that there's some things that you don't do. Anybody ever been around those people? Like, oh, man, I you. Don't drink alcohol. Going straight to hell. It's not even in the Bible, but we'll, we'll throw it out there. Or my, or my favorite, like, don't listen to secular music. That went straight to hell. In fact, when I first became a Christian, I thought that, like, secular music was the devil. So, like, if I heard a friend uh, listening to secular music, I would call by the friend and be like, we need to pray for them. Like, prayer service right now. Like, they need help. They listened to Beyonce, okay, like, and they're talking about single ladies, and they're a guy, okay, like, that's just not, you know, I, you know, and, and I became so legalistic, it's like, you can't be right with God if you're, you're, you're doing these things, and some of us get stuck into this performance mentality of thinking, like, if I just do this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and it's this legalism, it's legalism. What legalism does is it does a couple things to us. One, it, 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 it causes false guilt to happen in our life. Or it causes false confidence to happen in our life. False guilt or false confidence. Because what happens is, is when there are all these rules, and we don't meet those rules, what happens is, is we start to lose, we start to feel all of this guilt because we're not measuring up in life. We're not measuring up to the standards that some people have put on us. And, and because of that, we have all this guilt and we have all this shame. And we're constantly looking around and we're hoping that nobody will discover where we fell in life. Then on the flip side of that, if we are keeping all the rules, if we are doing all the little things and, and making it look like we've got it all going on, then we have this false confidence and we're puffed up and we're kind of arrogant in life. And neither one of those is a good thing because it all comes from this legalistic mentality. And Paul is admonishing us. Paul is encouraging us. Paul is telling us, like, listen, listen, listen. Be careful of that. I know you haven't experienced it yet, so you don't even know that that's happening in your life. But this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to end up with this guilt, or you're going to end up with this, this false confidence, and it's, it's going to sabotage your walk with Jesus. And you need to understand what's going on there. And so watch out for it. Don't get sucked into that. Because here's the deal. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. What that means is that, is that, Condemnation, where we feel condemned, that doesn't come from God. You know where that comes from? That comes from people. 
See, people bring condemnation on you. See what God does when He wants to change your heart? He brings conviction to you. And there's a big difference between those two words. Condemnation is from people. Conviction is from the Spirit of God. And so if God is doing something inside of you, that's okay. That's not legalism. That's God working on your heart. But when people are, because of rules and regulations they set up in you, and you're not meeting their expectations, that's condemnation. And there's none of that. And you, if you find yourself in that thing, you're in a legalistic mindset. At the same point, there's some of y'all that are walking around and you think, man, I'm, I'm awesome. I'm doing everything right. I serve. I give. I do this and I do that. And you're listening to all these things. And you've got some arrogance in your life. And God's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You better watch out. You better watch out. You get pretty legalistic because you're measuring your life based on what you do, not what God is doing in you. Paul says, see the dangers of legalism. Second thing he says is, see the dangers of of worldly distractions. Don't let the things of this world distract you. I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm pretty easily distracted by things. I have a lot of ADD and ADHD tendencies. Anybody else out there got some of those? Like a couple of us, I was never diagnosed, but I'm sure if they put me in there, I'd be mental right now. So that gives you a lot of confidence. And uh, and so, uh, and, and I'll tell you how, how like, I'm, just, I'm all over the place when I'm not. When, if you ever look at my notes, they're almost word for word. Because if they weren't, I would be jumping everywhere in life. I like try to memorize this so I don't have to get up here and be like, ah! But I was, uh, see, and that's what happens. You know, I go off my notes and that's like, but anyways, I was, a couple of years ago, I was up in Columbus. Um, my, my niece is is a soccer superstar and, and I'm a, her godfather and, and man, I love her. Her name is Haley. She's She's nine years old, and she is like an unbelievable soccer player. Like, she will eventually be on the USA team for the World Cup, for, and she'll dominate because she's just amazing. And, and so I was up there to see one of her games for the first time live. My sister has sent me a whole bunch of video of her and, and different things, and so I was excited. And, and so I was at her soccer game, and I took out my phone, and I was taking pictures, and I was videoing because I wanted to, I wanted to capture this moment because Shayla had never seen her play soccer live, and so I'm going crazy. Like, I'm the crazy uncle you want at your soccer game. Like, I will encourage you. I will encourage you to punch the other team, kick them. Like, I don't care. Whatever it takes to win. You know, like, we're winners in our family. Winners, whatever it takes. And so, like, I'm going crazy. I'm following Haley. I'm videoing. I'm like, oh, girl, you know, running up and down the sidelines. Like, other parents think I'm crazy. And, and, and so, like, I'm so excited for her. It's near the end of the game. Scores on 0-0. Zero, zero. And, and I'm videoing. And up on my phone, because I love shopping, uh, pops an alert of, of a sale that's about to end. It's got a minute left. And there were really a pair of shoes that I really wanted on that sale. <laughs> Dilemmas in life. You know, like, watch my niece play soccer for the first time or get a pair of shoes. And so immediately, I went to my phone to the sale. And, uh, and I, was, I was like, oh, man, Wi-Fi, hurry up, hurry up. Like, where is this? You know, you're looking for the signal. I'm, I'm typing in all my information because, the, the, like, the auction is closing on the sale. And it's getting down to the last 30 seconds. I'm trying to hit buy, and it's not working. Anybody ever had those first world problems? I mean, like, like, it's not working on my cell phone. Come on, Jesus, help me out. I need some shoes. Daddy needs some new shoes. And, uh... And I'm like so engaged with my cell phone that Haley scores a goal and I miss it and it wouldn't go through and I missed out on the second. Like I lost on both fronts. Like everybody's celebrating her goal. I guess it was like ESPN worthy. Like she had butted it in on the side. And like it was unbelievable. I didn't see it. So I don't know. But they showed reruns for three weeks on ESPN. Greatest goal ever. I, not really. But like... <laughs> But we get so easily distracted by things that don't really matter. Like, I missed out on one of the greatest moments of having this commonality with my niece over uh, another pair of shoes that would have just added to the collection. And I know that that's kind of a silly illustration, but how many divine moments do we miss out on because we get distracted by life? Distracted by things that really aren't very important they really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. And this is essentially what Paul's saying, but he's saying it in such a stronger way in verse 7. He says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, and I love this, I love, he says, How much is loss? He says, I consider everything a loss to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, 
my Lord. He said, man, I consider everything a loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Not obeying rules, not in trying to meet everybody's expectations. It's not about that. It's all about knowing Jesus and knowing Him personally. And maybe some of you guys, you're sitting out there today and all you've ever known was a whole bunch of rules and religion and religious activities. And you thought, man, if I could just accomplish all those religious activities, then, I, then God will accept me. And God's not after you doing all those religious activities. He's actually after your heart. He wants to know you personally. He wants to know you intimately. He wants to have a relationship with you. And he's saying, man, it's all about knowing Jesus. And maybe some of you don't know Jesus. And today is a day that you can experience knowing Jesus. Because it's the most important decision you will ever make. And he goes on to say, for whose sake I have lost all things. And then he says, I consider them rubbish. Everybody say rubbish. 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 Say rubbish. rubbish. Say it with some attitude. Say rubbish. rubbish. That's what I'm talking about. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. Now, if, if, if you get around close to it all, I, I've taught on this a little bit, but uh, that word rubbish there in the Greek, that word is actually the word scubula. Everybody say scubula. scubula. You're going to say it kind of dirty and like, kind of like scubula. You know, come on. That wasn't very dirty, okay? That was kind of, like, kind of clean and washed. Come on, come, get dirty with me. Not like talk dirty with me. Get dirty with me. I'll count the word. Okay. Scubula. Scubula. Thank you. All right, perfect. Scubula. Now, what scubula means there is it means to throw out to the dogs. It means to refuse. But what it really means is it really means dumb. Or uh, in a more modern language, it would be the swear word of dumb. Uh, if you've gone with the literal translation, but I don't think that would be very polite to say that word in church. And so, so I like to put it like this. Scubula happens. So if you don't know what it means, I should define it for you, okay? Uh, that's what it really means. You can look it up. I promise. Like, I'm not lying today. I'm telling the truth. I might lie next week. Okay. Uh, he's saying, like, listen, all these things are dumb. Compared to Jesus, compared to knowing Christ, all this stuff is scubula. It's not worth anything. It's worthless. It's a waste of time. It's, it's not that important. And so, like, all of these things that I thought were so important, I consider them, like, they're not even worthy of anything compared to knowing, really, really, really knowing Jesus. And see, Paul could understand that because he, he understands near-death experience because he's right in the midst of it. I don't know if you've ever had a near-death experience, but, but it changes your perspective when you've had one of those. I remember when Shayla and I were about three months married, and my dad lived in the Fort Myers area. We'd gone down to visit him, and we were driving back. And in our house, um, one of the rules we have is, is I don't really like to drive, and so Shayla kind of chauffeurs me around. It's an amazing arrangement. Um, if you really like riding in the passenger seat or in the back seat, it's awesome. Like, it, I feel really dignified doing that. And so, uh, and so Shayla was driving, and it started riding raining outside and Shayla really hates it when it rains outside and so she's she's kind of complaining about that and she's getting mad and we're starting to argue because she's driving in the rain and I don't want to drive and she's now really mad at me. You know we're having one of those first married fights where like we don't really know how to fight yet but it's about to get down and not pretty and so like finally like she's She's so angry, she's crying, you know, like that angry. And, and so we pull over because we're going to switch seats, and like lightning comes out and hits right next to our car. And now she's freaking out. Not only is she angry, but now she's scared. And like this pandelarium in our car. And so like I get in the driver's seat, and we start driving down the road. It starts raining a little bit harder. And uh, I hit a patch of water on the interstate on I 75, and I started to hydroplane. Now, I've never hydroplaned in my life, and so our car starts spinning towards one direction, so I start compensating the wheel. Now, I've learned that you're not supposed to do this, so don't take what I do and do it when you hydroplane, okay? And so, like, I start compensating the wheel the opposite direction as hard as I can to the point where I get it, it's turned as far as I can. Finally, my tires lock on the ground, and because I've compensated over too much, I start spinning out the other direction. And so I'm going back across the interstate now, which is really, really fun um, and really, really scary because I'm like, please don't hit anybody, please don't hit And so I'm overcompensating again because I don't know what I'm doing. And so, like, we hit stick tires, go back across the interstate, and overcompensating again, finally we go back the other way, take out about 150 yards of palmetto bushes, and hit a palm tree. And uh, as soon as we did it, the first thing I'm like, Shayla, are you okay? 
Like, I wasn't concerned, like, was our car okay? I wasn't concerned about, like, what the weather was like anymore. I didn't really care how the palm tree felt about that situation. Like, I wasn't concerned about its feelings. All I cared about was what mattered most was Shayla. Because I could replace a car, I could replant a palm tree, I couldn't grow another Shayla. Like, Shayla was what was important. And I'm going to be honest with you, after she said she was okay, I was like, was that not the coolest thing ever? Like, I was like... <laughs> Seriously, if I could build like a roller coaster of hydroplaning across the interstate, running and hitting trees, I would do it because it was amazing. <laughs> she never thought so, but I was like, that was awesome. Car was total, but whatever. Um, but in that moment, I could see what mattered and what didn't. And here's the thing we're all living a near death experience. Whether you realize it or not, your life is like a vapor. Could be done. Are you living for what matters most? Or are you getting caught up in the distractions of life that really are just sucking up your time? Paul's saying, man, I consider all those distractions, those things are a waste of time. They're a loss. What all that matters is knowing. Knowing Jesus. Then in verse 9 he says, being found in Christ. Not having a righteousness of mine, and I love this, that comes from the law. He said, it's not about me, it's not about my behavior, it's about knowing Jesus. He's saying it's not about those things, it's not about all those things that we think are so external. Like the external things, those, those will change. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He's saying we're only made right by God through faith. Like it's God's grace that makes us right, not our actions, not our abilities. It's what he's already done that makes us right. And then he says, I want to know Christ. And that is my prayer for all of us to know Christ. So our prayer would be, I want to know you more. I want to know you more, Jesus. I want to know you more than I ever have before. I want to know you, Lord. And the power of your resurrection. He said, this isn't some empty gospel. This isn't some powerless thing. But he says, I want you to know the power of the gospel and the power of Christ. And in the fellowship of his sufferings, to suffer with him, to suffer like him, becoming like him in death, that somehow you may attain the resurrection of the dead. He's saying, man, it's all about that. But he's trying to get us to see that maybe some of us are focusing on the things in life, the distractions of life, that aren't very important in this grand scheme of eternity. He says, man, if you experience the goodness of God, you'll start to see what I see, and you'll never get distracted by those things anymore. And thirdly, he says, man, I want you to see the dangers of spiritual complacency. He says, I want you to see the dangers of spiritual complacency. Now, um, my wife and I, we were just on vacation, and vacation is always an interesting time, and, and I love vacation, like it was amazing, and I didn't really want to come back home, um, not because I didn't want to come back to work and do this, I, lo I love this, I didn't want to come back to work for one specific promise that I made my wife, any, any guys out there ever made a promise that you know that like you're going to regret when you get back, and you have to fulfill that promise, and, and see, part of my promise had to do with, with health, and, uh, and, and for me, I, when I was growing up, I was an athlete, I played sports, I had a college scholarship to play football, and in my mind, even though I'm 35 years old today, I'm still like legendary in my mind. Anybody else feel me like that? Like, like I'm still like this unbelievable athlete in my mind. Like, my, 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 my body is not real on the same page as my mind at this point. You know, like, like I, I see people do it. Like, I watch the CrossFit games, and I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> you know, in my mind, I'm like, man, I'll just jump up there and do, like, 75 pull-ups, no problem. You know, like, I, I, like, I just think that I'm unbelievable. And But I noticed over the last two months, I, I wouldn't wait myself right before a vacation, and I gained, like, 17 pounds in two months. Like, those were a bad two months, okay? Like, like too many little daddies, okay? And, and so, like, my wife said, hey, and when we get back from vacation, you work out with me. And I said, you know what? I will work out with you if we can do CrossFit. And she's like, okay. And uh, then we went on vacation, and we were on a cruise, and so I was eating at a buffet, and all of a sudden, I was like, I don't really ever want to do CrossFit. <laughs> like, I visited that buffet a few too many times for CrossFit. And, uh... 
And so we showed up the first day, and uh, they, they have to do some fundamentals classes, and so uh, we're doing the fundamentals, and we're, we're doing, you know, some deadlifts, and we're doing squats, and we're doing some pull-ups, and we're learning how this thing called kipping, which helps you do pull-ups and all these things, and, and so then we're doing like these wall balls, you know, where you squat down and throw a ball up over a lawn that's like 10 feet in the air, like, whoever thought of that, they're going straight to hell, I'm just telling you that right now, like, like if they're not, they deserve to, okay? Um, and so we're doing all this stuff, and at the end of it, they're like, hey, we're going to put you through like a mini CrossFit workout just so you can kind of get the experience. And I'm like, oh, okay. And again, I'm like, and, and Shayla and I are the only ones in this class, and they're like, so you guys can just compete against each other. And I'm like, there is no way I'm losing to my life. Like, just, just no way. Like, I'm such a better athlete than her, even though she works out like seven days a week <laughs> for like the last year, uh, you know, like in unbelievable shape. And... But every 5K we've done, I've beat her. I'm just kind of prefacing this. Again, what happens in here stays in here. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen? Okay? Um, and so we start off, and we're going through the exercises, and we're doing some burpees, and uh, the wall ball things are killing me. I'm like, I hate you, trainer. And, you know, and we're doing the other things, and we finish up with like a 200-meter run, and so we're running. And on our way back in for our next set, we have five sets to do. Uh, Shayla passes me, and I'm like, oh, no. She did not. And so we get in there, we we'll start getting the burpees again. And about my fourth burpee, like, I start feeling kind of burpy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, like, instead of, you know, throwing up like I normally would, I just stop because I'm like, sweat is dripping. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like dying here. I think I'm having a heart attack, literally. I'm like, somebody help me. It's like Chicago, like the Chicago Devils, you know, and having heart attacks right there at the gym. And I've got the wall ball things and I'm throwing them up there and I'm, I can't get it up to the line. And so the guy comes and takes away the 20 pound ball and gives me like the lightest ball they have there, which is like the most humiliating thing in the world. I'm just going to tell you that right now, especially when my wife is doing like twice as much weight. Humiliating. I'm like, come on, bro, couldn't you like at least wait until she left and like switch it out so I didn't look like a loser? And uh, by the end of it, when I'm in my fifth set, my wife is just sitting there on a bench watching me because she's been like done for like seven minutes. Should have never happened, but you know what? I got complacent. My greatest fear isn't that we'll get spiritually complacent. I mean, I fear or, or physically complacent. I fear that. My greatest fear is that as a church we'll become spiritually complacent. Where we'll remember what we've done in the past, which is great things. Like, man, we've read our Bible or we've or we've memorized the scripture, but then we stop doing the things that are necessary to continue to grow in our relationship with God. Like, we stopped pursuing God with the passion that we first started with. Like, when I played high school football, man, I worked out every day. But since I've been a pastor, I eat jelly donuts every day. <laughs> like, I became complacent in my health. But a lot of us, we do that in our marriage, spiritually. We stop doing the things that are necessary to cultivate a healthy relationship, and we become complacent in our relationship with our spouse. Some of us, with our kids, we stop doing the things that are necessary to help them grow, to help them have character and morals, and we expect the school system to do that, or we expect coastal kids to do that. And let me just tell you something. Man, those venues are only going to reinforce what you're doing at home. We become complacent. And Paul is warning us. He's saying, listen guys, don't get complacent in the things that got you so passionate about God. Don't miss out on what's important most. Don't become lackadaisical in your worship to God. Don't become lackadaisical in your giving. Don't become lackadaisical in your community that you need to be engaging in. Don't become lackadaisical in pursuing me through prayer and through the word. Don't, don't stop doing the things that got you to the place where you are. And he's saying this from prison. From a place where he could have been like, man, I just give up. And somebody said, no, 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 don't give up. Don't give up in this situation, man. Do something about it. Do something about it. And in verse 12, he says, he says, not that I've already attained all this. Where it's been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. He's saying, listen, I've done a lot of my life, but I haven't arrived. Like, there's still more to do. And let me tell you something. There's still more to do in your life. Like, you haven't arrived yet. You haven't got it all figured out. Like, he's saying, don't, don't just think, like, oh, man, I've, I've attended all these classes or I've done these things. Like, I'm good. Like, he's saying, man, there's more. 
He says, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of this. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, and straining and pressing on toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's saying, listen, if you've experienced what I've experienced, man, if you've done what I've done, then you're going to start to see things that I've seen. And, and man, I've seen God been faithful over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter what situation you're in or what, how bad your, your marriage is right now or how bad your finances are or what's going on with your kids right now. It doesn't matter how bad it's been because of what has happened, what you've seen around you. Man, God can do the same thing. And, and Paul is saying this as he's in prison Rome. All he's ever wanted to do was go to Rome and preach and he's in prison. And he says, like, but, but listen, even though I'm not here under the ideal circumstances, like God still got something to go on. And I'm going to keep going on. doesn't matter what it looks like around me. doesn't matter what circumstances I'm facing. Like, I know God is faithful. And because God is faithful, man, I'm going to run after him. And I'm going to continue to run after him. And I'm going to go after him with all I've got. And so as long as I'm alive and as long as I've got a pen and a piece of paper, I'm going to continue to preach the gospel. Exactly what he's doing right here. As long as prisoners or uh, the, the guards are chained to me four times a day, as long as I've got them, I'm going to preach them every single day. The message of Jesus be one to one because I press on toward the prize. Man, there's something more for my life. And let me tell you something. There's something more for your life today. Some of you guys have given up on life based on the circumstances. Some of you have given up on your marriage. Listen, God has got more in store for you if you'll just press on. Yeah, that's a good place to talk right there. I'm glad we got the golf clock. That was awesome. Paul said, man, press on. But you got to see the dangers. You've got to see the dangers of legalism. Don't get caught up in a whole bunch of rules and regulations. Get caught up in pursuing a relationship with Jesus. Get caught up in that. It's not about what you can do. It's about what he's already done. He already did it all on the cross. It's our job is to follow hard after him all the days of our lives. He said, don't get distracted by all the worldly distractions. Things are being thrown at us every day. We've got Twitter. We've got Facebook. We've got Instagram. We've got email. We've got all these things. What are they going to matter a few years from now? What are they going to matter? Don't get distracted by those things. Get, focus on what matters most, man. Focus on your kids. Focus on your family. Focus on your relationship with God. Like those relationships are eternal. Like those people are ending up somewhere. He said, don't get comfortable spiritually. Like if you're not dead, God's not done. God's still got a plan for your life. He wants to do something in your life. Don't quit before you get to the cross. The prize is spending eternity in heaven. And until we get there, man, we're to work and run after Jesus with everything that we've got to know him in a greater way. Not for our glory, but for his. Let's pray. God, I just pray today that your spirit would move and speak to every single one of us. God, that we would be people that are driven by your presence. And, and today, God, I know that there's some people in here that... You know, for most of their life, all they've known about when it comes to God is a whole bunch of rules and regulations, and it has been a, about a lot of religion. I mean, that's really what it's been about. It's, it's been about all of those things. And they've replaced a relation with you for a bunch of rules. And maybe today you're out there and you recognize that and you say, man, I, I'm, I'm going to run it after the false thing. And today you can have a relationship with Jesus. It, it, it starts with easy. It starts with you accepting Him, knowing that He died on the cross 2,000 plus years ago, lived a sinless life, died and rose again, and went to heaven so that He could restore relationship between you and God. And maybe that's a decision that you need to make here today. Maybe you need to accept that and not live with this false guilt or this false confidence based on what you've done. Because what you've done doesn't matter compared to what he's done because he already did it all on the cross. Then there's others of you that you've just been distracted in life. You've been distracted by things that are good, some things that are bad. Today, maybe we need to turn our attention to what matters most. You know, the Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. And maybe today we need to take our eyes off some of the distractions. Maybe it's
for the single people out there, maybe it's somebody the opposite sex. Maybe if you're out there and, and you're married, you're having some marriage problems, all you're looking at is the problem rather than looking at the solution, which is Jesus. And you need to fix your eyes on him today. Maybe it's some other dilemma that you're going through right now. And instead of continuing to look at the things that are distracting you, you need to start looking to the person who can perfect that thing, which is Jesus Christ. Then there's there's other of us that just got complacent, got lazy, just in a walk with God. And today it's, it's time to get back on track. It's time to to not just have the go to heaven car, but to live in a life that's fully devoted to God. And so God, I pray here today, no matter what stage that we're at, no matter where we find ourselves, God, that we would repent, which means that we would turn 180 degrees, that we would make a change in our life, and we would fix our attention and our eyes on you. God, that you would become our everything, our all in all, what you were always designed to be the King of kings and Lord of lords of our life. And so as we get ready to sing this song, it says, Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. I pray that that would be our prayer here today. That we would pursue the love of God like never before. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.